Welcome everyone to Expanding Chronic Care Management with Remote Patient Monitoring. My name is Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Better. Today, I am delighted to present this program that we have developed together with one of our member companies, CareSignal, which is a leader in deviceless remote patient monitoring. Their solution has become increasingly important in our current environment where we have uh, obviously seen great interest in being able to monitor and connect with and manage people outside of traditional healthcare facilities. Uh, we were talking just a few minutes ago before we started broadcasting about how 2020 dumpster fire Christmas ornaments are apparently becoming quite popular now. Uh, but if there is a silver lining to 2020, it's that there has been a great acceleration of uh, development and particularly of adoption of digital healthcare uh, technologies in categories such as remote patient monitoring. So we have a great team for the conversation today. Uh, first, we have Robert Gallian, who is Director of Quality and Population Health at SLU Care which is the academic medical practice of St. Louis University with more than 600 providers around the St. Louis region. He's held roles at a number of health systems around the country uh, and also worked for a couple of years for a Matter member company. Uh, next, we have Kate Brady, Innovation Manager at Advocate Aurora Health. Advocate Aurora is one of the 10 largest not-for-profit health systems in the country, serving nearly 3 million patients annually with more than 500 sites of care. Uh, Kate has a fascinating background. Uh, she traded bond futures for a number of years before she founded several technology companies uh, and recently uh, held senior roles at uh, also at two Matter member companies uh, before joining Advocate Aurora. Uh, finally, we have Blake Margraff, who's the CEO of CareSignal. Uh, Blake founded CareSignal uh, straight after graduating from uh, what is inarguably the greatest undergraduate university on the planet, Washington University uh, in St. Louis. It's my alma mater. Uh, so we're going to kick things off with a short presentation from Blake, uh, giving us uh, kind of a lay of the land. And following his presentation, I will moderate a conversation with our panel. Uh, if you have questions you'd like to ask them, please use the chat function and I will incorporate your questions as best I can throughout the uh, conversation. So with that, Blake, I will turn things over to you to get us started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen um, and Kate and Rob. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to join you. I feel, uh, I feel that um, exactly as Stephen said, you know, if there is one silver lining, it's, it's that uh, we've been accelerating digital health, especially for the patients and, uh, and healthcare organizations that need it most. Um, perfect. Great timing, Casey. Thank you so much. So the focus today, I want to be super clear, is, is not on, not on CareSignal. We'll describe one of the relationships that we're privileged to have with uh, the SLU Care Physician Group, uh, now, now uh, with SSM um, or under SSM. Um, you know, high level care signal uh, provides deviceless remote patient monitoring, helping groups scale their virtual care capabilities and helping their rubber meet the road for the large patient populations that need it most. Um, and Casey, on the next slide, we'll see uh, the high level objectives for today. Um, first, just doing a quick pulse check on the sentiment on the patient side and the provider side as it pertains to virtual health. What are people uh, feeling? Uh, what are they investing in? Um, and how is this uh, purported wave of virtual health manifesting itself, especially as we deal with a similar, although um, uh, much more uh, detrimental wave of COVID as the year comes to an end here. Um, we'll go into uh, the, the tough balancing act of maintaining both revenue, you know, no, no, uh, no mission if there's no margin, and also relationships, uh, making sure that providers can keep up that strong, high credibility clinical relationship with the patients and populations they serve, uh, and discuss the pros and cons of different technologies that enable those two things. 
Um, Rob will then join me and we'll talk through uh, a, a sample use case, which is uh, the care signal plus SLU care use case as just one of a number of ways to tackle this massive and very important problem and the outcomes to date. And then we'll move into a panel discussion um, um, where Kate and Rob and Stephen will really take the, take the reins. Uh, this entire uh, um, initial presentation will just, just take 10 minutes or so. So, so you know, no, no, no dawdling. Um, let's go ahead and dive right in and talk about uh, the trends in virtual care, which just unquestionably is here to stay. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at about a quarter trillion dollars in spend, a uh, combination of the classic fee-for-service, but more and more that spend is, is, uh, is flowing through value-based contracts as, as the VBC uh, uh, wave increases. Um, and you see a shift in consumer sentiment as well. Um, incredibly, about three quarters of patients are now interested in using telehealth, and that's sticking even after uh, that's out of a, a need of, of for personal safety. Um, in, in other words, uh, to avoid exposure to COVID, there's there's been an increasing um, uh, propensity of patients to prefer virtual first, um, and really striking if you look at uh, the past partner research over the past few years, there's been a really dramatic acceleration on the provider side. Uh, in terms of intent to spend. So where uh, remote patient monitoring as a key component of an overall virtual care strategy is usually is a, is a top three goal for the majority, more than 50% of US health systems uh, and uh, looking at um, a report by Spyglass, which is already uh, starting to show its age, even in 2019, um, the vast majority of health systems intend to make deeper investments in RPM. Um, but now we hit a problem, which is it's great that these groups want to move in that direction, but how do they focus on the right patient population, um, especially when that population is not necessarily obvious. Um, and on the next slide, just to kind of make this, uh, make this a little bit more um, accessible, um, you know, a, a lot of folks intuit that it makes sense to spend a ton of money and resources to control costs of the top 1% uh, utilizers in the healthcare system, which we know is 25, 30, maybe a little bit more than 30% of total healthcare spend. Um, intuitively, that makes a lot of sense, right? It's a small group of patients, you load resources on them, and you should be able to materially bend the cost curve. Uh, but uh, a 2020 publication in one of the New England Journal of Medicine journals showed that, uh, in fact, from a uh, cost benefit perspective, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, uh, there's more money to be made by focusing on populations in this so-called rising risk bucket defined as having multiple chronic conditions, um, but nowhere near the utilization uh, of the high risk population. Um, in other words, it's time to start investing at least to some extent in immediately preventative care. We're not talking about a 30 year time horizon to return on investment. Uh, but instead focusing on patients where you can you can squeeze ROI in, in the short term uh, if you make the appropriate investments. Um, and now we go from the, you know, the why to the how. Um, first stage here when we look at this um, remote monitoring and engagement spectrum is to acknowledge that there are really three categories. One of them kind of disappears in the other two on the next slide. Um, the first uh, with which I think everyone on this call is familiar is remote patient monitoring, right? It's the suite of connected devices, you know, whether it's one or several or even a full hospital at home setup. Um, and obviously that's extremely clinically impactful and very clinically actionable, which is awesome. It's not that scalable, but if it's done correctly, it doesn't need to be. This is not a solution designed for all patients, right? CMS with the remote patient monitoring reimbursement codes is very smart. They recognize that, uh, that it's not appropriate to you know, pay $100, $200 a month for every single patient in a population. And on the other side of the spectrum, uh, you have patient engagement, um, which is commodified, but for most folks, is actually more than sufficient. Um, it allows for that digital front door and an ongoing relationship to be formed. And in the middle um, is, is what we call deviceless remote patient monitoring. Um, for the population, again, in that rising risk bucket, it can be great to have something that's much more scalable than traditional remote patient monitoring with devices, um, but just as clinically impactful and of course, lower cost. Uh, and I think, you know, trying to trying to lean into that is uh, is going to be key strategically and make sure that all three of those categories are, are checked and addressed appropriately, especially for organizations that are pursuing more and more risk as we emerge from the pandemic and get back to the to the uh, 
the, the road to value-based care. Um, I'll share a key learning on our side, uh, on the care signal side, which is that perhaps the single most important element of this type of solution on the next slide is the right technology. Um, if you don't have uh, ubiquitously accessible technology, um, and Casey, we can go to slide six. Uh, if you don't have technology that meets patients where they are uh, and that folks can use easily, seamlessly, um, then you're gonna really struggle to scale. Worth noting that that's not to say that uh, device-based solutions don't work. So when I think through our, our roster of client partners today, health systems and payers alike, uh, the most successful ones, again, are investing across the spectrum. Um, they're supporting the, the toughest, highest acuity populations um, with, I'd say, just to give an order of magnitude, a budget of anywhere from $100 to $1,000 per month. Um, but, but, again, the most successful are also investing in that $1 to $10 per month range for the uh, step um, below. Um, on, on the care signal side, you know, we've, we've, we've gone beyond just the type of technology and even formed relationships with the big cellular carriers so that we can send messages through for free to phones that might be out of minutes or might be pay as you go phones. Um, again, it's this, this kind of maniacal focus on accessibility and engagement um, that winds up, uh, winds up working well. Um, on slide seven, framed another way, um, I think it's worth first pointing out that RPM is just the best at capturing biometrics um, and, uh, and is reimbursed accordingly for that. Um, so looking at the bottom, you know, whether it's, whether it's blood sugar, you know, fasting blood glucose, um, systolic diastolic monitoring longitudinally, patient weight, um, think about patients where you need to track, um, um, you know, uh, uh, potential water retention to avoid decompensation for heart failure, where you're trying to track, uh, track patients with uh, very poorly controlled A1Cs to make sure um, that they're not over titrated and become hypoglycemic, right? That's where devices, really a hands-on approach, make a lot of sense. Um, and then that deviceless remote patient monitoring side can potentially help expand to other areas. Uh, chronic conditions, sure, where you're tracking qualitative symptomatology, breathing quality perhaps day over day, but also expand into behavioral health, uh, social determinants of health, everything from you know, access to food, housing security, personal safety, access to education. Um, and I think maternal health is, is finally uh, reaching its moment in the US healthcare system in terms of both incentives and a recognition of need. Um, and again, it's, it's a balance of the two. Um, let, let's pop to slide eight for just, just a few seconds here. Um, uh, you know, very, very high level uh, care signal, uh, and we're privileged to be a part of Matter um, because we're learning so much from from uh, from how Matter approaches partnering and innovating within all types of healthcare organizations, especially health systems. Um, care signal tackles all of these different areas with the goal of helping align with the current strategic imperative of organizations and scaling with the strategies of those organizations as they change and evolve over time, ranging from care gaps to whole person care. And then of course, you know, a lot of folks are really laser focused on, for instance, MSSP uh, populations, just driving quality through increasingly capitated um, type structures and contracts. Okay, that was a whole lot all at once, um, but high level, <laughs> it's a great time to be working in virtual health, especially uh, helping helping keep tabs on the patient populations that need it most through different types of remote patient monitoring in order to drive ROI. Um, I'd love to invite Rob to hop on via video and audio, um, and we'll now go through some real world uh, use cases. You know, kind of tell some stories about how this is having an impact today um, before transitioning to the panel discussion. Um, so. Um, Rob has a really impressive background, including, in, interestingly, pandemic preparedness, uh, which uh, I feel like is, is coming in handy. That's hard to ask for a better skill set for the, for the population health uh, lead at uh, one of the preeminent uh, physician groups in the country. Um, Rob, would you like to provide a high-level overview of how uh, Slew Care and Care Signal are working together? Um, and then we can pop into some of the outcomes that we've seen so far. Sure. Thank you, Blake. Uh, and yeah, I've been dusting off my pandemic preparedness material from about 10 plus years ago. So 
it hasn't really helped me much, but uh, always good to utilize your experiences. So, um, but thank you, Blake. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've uh, we've had a real nice partnership with Care Signal uh, for a number of years, and we'd like to continue that. Um, and uh, this is great timing, actually, and I'll share why um, going through some of these slides. But just to, to go through the workflow first for you, um, Care Signal has allowed us uh, a pretty efficient process in doing so, where uh, we simply just are identifying those patients with conditions and providing those to Care Signal, um, allowing our team members, our care team, <clears throat> to reach out to those and members, uh, those patients, excuse me, and gather consent. Uh, giving them the opportunity to opt in and out, opt out of those uh, of of the process, and then um, you know those patients are then uh, sent material and tell tell us if they are you know fall into a condition, um, selling, sending us their relevant data you know from home and from their own convenient location, which obviously is uh, the the most important thing here is uh, allowing the convenience um, for our patients, um, and then what CareSignal will do was sort of uh, categorize each, uh, each patient by condition. And you see from this red, yellow, green um, uh, identifiers, we really wanna put uh, as many patients as we can into the green from the red to green or yellow to green, uh, which we've been successfully knock on wood been able to do so uh, in partnering with Care Signal. Um, and that's our ultimate goal, no matter how we get there is to move those patients into, into green. And this allows us to really identify those patients and really keep track uh, with their help uh, to uh, providing the best care we can and, and moving in, into those green levels. And then um, finally, our care managers will then respond to patients with the appropriate intervention. We will utilize uh, you know, our providers and resources internally uh, to make those decisions. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a good time to have this discussion because we've really over the past maybe two months, um, we've really ramped up our, uh, our utilization and partnership with uh, Care Signal. Uh, we've uh, primarily been utilizing uh, the service with our family, family community medicine departments and uh, you know, not quite as much in our internal med medicine department. So we've really made a large effort and uh, push to broaden uh, our usage and utilization throughout our internal medicine department where holds our by far largest population of patients. So um, we've made uh, some really good strides in, uh, you know, providing education and awareness with the help of the care signal teams uh, to expand into our internal med departments and again, just uh, make an impact for our patients. And it's been, it's so far, it's been a, a, a good success. Blake, do you want to add any color or do you want to move to the next slide? No, I think you nailed it. Uh, I was about to say, you know, hopping to the next slide, we can see what that looks like. Um, and high level for, for all of our partners, you know, Care Signal, we're, we're, I'd like to, Rob, you know, you trust your judgment here, but I'd like to say we're kind of our own harshest critic. You know, we, we want to see not only that we're driving activation and engagement, and oh my God, look at that. I didn't, I didn't realize you're at 95% activation. That's, um, well, that's, I mean, that's the quality uh, of the slew care physician group showing, right? You have just phenomenal relationships, but starting with activation and engagement, moving through to uh, risk reduction, um, which is kind of the leading indicator of financial returns, but then tracking true clinically specific outcomes. And I won't speak to it too much, but yeah, Rob, um, any, any color on this? Yeah, so the, in, my, in my role, the really the most, one of the most important pieces, obviously, is making sure that we're making, uh, you know, coordinated efforts for our patients, but I unfortunately have the, uh, the realistic part of it to look at the financials and look at the return and make sure this partnership is worthwhile for our group. And um, as Blake said, you can see, I won't get too much into the, the uh, nitty gritty details of, of, of each, uh, each data point, but um, we see where we're really driving utilization. Uh, Care Signal provides those utilization reports to us so we can make those informed decisions based on data, not just on assumption. Um, we see that we are making uh, you know, impactful strides and moving the needle forward to moving those patients into green. So again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is why we are expanding and, and working to expand so much in one of our largest populations of internal medicine, uh, because we have seen um, this effective work from, uh, you know, from past and from sort of not a smaller scale with family medicine, but certainly not quite as large within internal medicine. So we want to continue to 
use that positive momentum. Uh, and Blake, I have to knock on wood again. I hope you don't jinx me there. But yeah, hopefully we continue to move the needle and see such great numbers in utilization. So CareSignal has been great in transparency transparency, and allowing us to uh, to see our utilization when needed and you know tweak, you know, adjust workflows to, uh, to make sure that we're getting the right return. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. Super cool. Well, as promised, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, Kate and Stephen, if, if you're game to hop on and join, um, and Casey, we can probably uh, cut the screen share um, and go to the important part of this conversation, learning how different groups are approaching. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Blake, for uh, for sharing that, for, for giving us a little bit of the lay of the land. And um, yeah, I think for, for some people who are watching, um, perhaps introducing the concept of deviceless remote patient monitoring and kind of what that means. I mean, I, I will tell you when I first heard it, which could just be me, but when I first heard that term, I thought, oh, so they're just calling people. Are there like, you know, it's because to a sense, there's been remote patient monitoring forever and people knocking on doors or, you know, calling. And so, you know, Rob, maybe I'll continue the, the thread with you is, um, you know, we've seen a pretty dramatic expansion of telehealth and remote patient monitoring uh, recently. Um, can you talk about how, you know, go a little deeper into how your strategy has shifted, but also if you can we kind of go back in time and the the as we've seen the evolution of this notion of engaging people outside of the walls of the hospital uh kind of how you've how your uh, organization has been uh has been approaching that and has been evolving uh, over time as technologies have evolved as well sure thank you Stephen. so um you know Unfortunately, due to COVID, we'd really have to ramp up our, our uh, kind of flexibility and, and focus towards virtual and telehealth. Um, and that sort of pushed us, the, you know, one small positive out of maybe all this is that we're sort of moving to a new uh, method of, of care or utilizing the technologies that we have all around us every day, uh, utilizing, you know, with family, FaceTime, friends, and, and, and so forth. So, um, you know, we've really had to quickly uh, adjust to allowing virtual care and, and standing up virtual care. And we did it in almost, I think, seven days back in April. Uh, so a credit to our, our internal team to do that because uh, obviously it's a lot of work. But, um, you know, one thing since I've been in sort of the pop health uh, care management uh, space over the years is uh, access to care has been one of the, one of the largest challenges, um, you know, without technology. And getting patients through the door into the buildings scheduled, um, you know, there's transportation issues, there's social issues, uh, et cetera. And, um, you know, it's always been a challenge to get patients through the door as scheduled. So utilizing the technology we have around us sort of as a no brainer, um, but, you know, with COVID, unfortunately, it's sort of pushed us uh, to really ramp that up. Um, you know, being flexible is important in, in that sense because uh, we do still find challenges where patients either don't have, uh, depending on their locations, don't have access to Wi-Fi or internet or maybe are as computer savvy. Um, but we have to take those pieces into account and, um, you know, open the doors to maybe a new way of utilizing, uh, you know, your provider, utilizing your PCP, going to get, uh, you know, whatever service you may, it may be, rather than walking through a building, you're on your couch at home and you don't have to go anywhere. Um, so... You know, it's been a challenge, but it's uh, been beneficial. And we've seen over the past, uh, you know, eight months or so with, uh, with COVID, maybe eight, eight months, give or take, um, the strides we've taken internally to push the technology, you know, we have around us and, you know, how much patients are now, uh, it take, it's taken a little bit of time, I think, for patients to get used to, um, you know, logging into their computer and sort of divulging their, you know, health information to providers um, and not being in a little exam room. Uh, but we've seen our numbers tick up quite a bit, um, and that's a testament to the technology that uh, we have presented. And you know, it's been it's been very effective. Uh, we hope to continue once we get past COVID, hopefully soon. Uh, we'll we'll continue to see it in my in my view, uh, telehealth be at the forefront of, of patient care. Um, Kate, you know, the strategy. Talk a little bit about the strategy at Advocate 
Aurora when it comes to remote patient monitoring? Is it similar to you know what you've heard from Rob? Um, and and in particular, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you know how do you think about which patients are appropriate for remote patient monitoring RPM with devices, without devices, or um, yeah, I guess not at all to a certain extent. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, well, as a we have a large um, value-based care population, and so we've been doing remote patient monitoring. Um, for many years, generally starting in the post-acute side of things, but certainly with COVID, that's just like ramped up all the use of technologies, um, including um, symptom checking bots. Um, we've certainly expanded um, RPM to people so that we can treat people at home who have COVID. Um, and then our virtual visits um, has just, you know, Obviously, we've it's exploded. I mean, we had we luckily we had started working on virtual visits back um, in 2019, but we have by now uh, probably over 800,000 uh, virtual visits um, have been completed within our system. Um, you know, patients are a lot more comfortable than we thought with virtual virtual visits and telehealth, um, and so it's it's. Unfortunately, we have the situation, but fortunately, we have technologies that are, are that are at the right place at the right time. And how do you, um, so well, let me go, you mentioned you have a large value-based care uh, population, you have large value contracts and risk contracts. And, and Blake, you mentioned in your presentation, uh, you kind of alluded as you were uh, as you were kind of kicking things off, that that uh, that that telehealth and remote patient monitoring are tied to uh, to the the growth of value based care. So, Kate, let me just follow up with you a, a little bit on that. Is when when you look at the kind of Advocate Aurora's population, is is that the place where you're using remote patient monitoring? Kind of exclusively, or you know, holistically. What? How's? How do you? What's the strategy there? Yeah, sure. Um, so the we obviously we we started in um, started using remote patient monitoring with our our value based population, um, and we were obviously looking at the um, kind of as it, as it's rolled out. We're looking at the rising risk population um, and in population health, but then with COVID, we're using it really, we're using remote patient monitoring across the system. In fact, we're even using it, um, we were part of the state of Illinois COVID response. And so we've been using it for patient, for people who aren't official patients of ours um, in terms of um, being able to track COVID and treat people with COVID. Um, but in regards to like the, in population health, um, you know, you're spot on, um, Blake and, and Rob, in regards to looking at the rising risk population and, um, and how important it is to um, be able to um, track and, and handle that population because it does make a big impact. In fact, we're working with a, a former matter company on um, um, being able to track and work with people who have um, stage one um, kidney chronic kidney disease and um, through the company is actually LifePod, which is um, a matter company that provides an, an Alexa device um, that does proactive and reactive speech so that you can ask people about their conditions and um, get a re response. So it's, um, it's certainly you know, an important part of our um, technology, RPM, or it's certainly part of not only our population health strategy, but really across the board, um, you know, whether it's working with seniors or even in pediatrics, we have some really interesting remote patient monitoring happening there. Um, and have you, or, or Rob, I'll ask you this question. Um, have you had, uh, so you presented a 95% adoption, which uh, of, of care signals 
technology, which um, caused Blake to um, sort of jump with joy or something like that when he was when you when you showed that. Um, you know, that's among physicians, which is you know one enormous challenge with the um, kind of the dissemination of of any of these kinds of technologies. Um, can you talk about it from the patient viewpoint as to what kind of engagement are you seeing uh, from the patient side? And has that been more or less challenging than you uh, would have anticipated? I think that from the patient perspective, it's been fairly positive. Um, you know, like I said earlier, <clears throat> we sort of give the patients the opportunity to opt in and out of the program as, you know, as they wish. Um, I don't think anyone loves getting random texts and calls. Uh, I know I don't, and it happens all the time. Um, you know, so you're sort of opting in and you have these opportunities, but I think patients understand that, you know, the reason that we're in this program and we're utilizing these methods uh, is for their benefit. And, um, you know, I was a bit skeptical to see the, you know, the utilization so great and doing so well, um, because uh, like I said, you know, everyone gets a number of texts and calls and things of that nature, and it can get a bit overwhelming at times. Um, but I think patients, for the most part, have understood that this is uh, just another way that we are attempting to care for them um, than sort of the traditional methods of coming through a building. So um, it, it's okay for, you know, everyone has a cell phone these days, everyone's checking their cell phone. Uh, if you get pinged one day and, you know, we want to know how you're feeling, um, I think patients have really, you know, took to that and uh, have, have welcomed that opportunity. And if they don't want to participate, they don't participate. So uh, we give them an opportunity, but I've been quite pleased with, um, with the response we, we get from patients. And I think from the utilization we've seen from CareSignal, um, you know, has been positive, which is why we want to, as I mentioned earlier, expand into more of our internal medicine departments, because we can, uh, we have seen that it's been effective. We have seen that we've uh, moved a lot of the patients into that green status, quote unquote. Um, so we're making positive strides. Um, not everyone will participate, we understand that. But uh, if we can move the needle in a positive way, if we can manage our patients, and it helps understand our patients as well, um, you know, it can give us an opportunity to understand if maybe they'll log in and use their my chart rather than using the phones and we use uh, ease some of the burden on on our phone calls and our, our call centers. So uh, just sort of different ways that we can sort of understand and get into the minds of our patients and understand how willing they are to use that technology uh, that's presented to them. Um, Blake, are, are there things, you know, you're relying on a lot on text messaging as Rob just mentioned that as a, you know, are there things that you can't ask patients or, you know, about their medical condition? Are there any limitations or restrictions uh, that you've, that you've come across? Not, not really. Um, again, you know, if, if you're doing something like text or email, right, um, for HIPAA, you, you, you know, you have to make sure you have patient consent, right, and you're, you're communicating the way the patient prefers, which is, which is specifically afforded for um, in, in the HIPAA um, uh, uh, legislation. Um, you know, I, I'd say it's more focusing on asking questions that are meaningful to a patient. That's to Rob's point, right, like technology is meh. <laughs> That's, I think EHR portals prove that completely. Um, but an extension of a strong existing relationship with a closed feedback loop that helps patients know that if something concerning begins to arise, um, that, uh, that they'll continue to receive that excellent level of care in a, in a timely way um, that also is convenient and, and efficient for them. Um, that's the whole point, right? Ideally, the, the best technology in healthcare disappears, um, and, and all that's left is the relationship and the clinical outcomes longer term. Yeah, I like that. That the you know the best technology disappears uh, uh, for sure. Um, it, so, um, Kate, you know, you talked about uh, you know again going back to the um, sort of large uh, risk population. Um, that you have. Can you just talk a little bit more about reimbursement and how important that is or how, um, how available that is for, uh, for, for different 
uh, remote monitoring solutions that you uh, are looking at and, and how that factors into your uh, kind of overall man uh, population management strategy? Uh, well, I can talk a little bit about reimbursement, but um, only in regards that I know that there are certainly um, codes that are appropriate for remote patient monitoring and there are codes for even looking at, you know, for physicians who take the time to look at the data. Um, and so there's, there are certainly um, opportunities to, to, um, to get reimbursement for using RPM. And sometimes it's a matter of how do you, as educating the providers or the physicians that these codes are available. And the other half of it is also trying to, you know, being able to track the time that people use when they're doing, you know, when, for instance, again, providers are, are using uh, remote patient monitoring or they're checking in on a patient. Um, but that's about as far as my knowledge on reimbursement goes. You have to remember that I'm a strategy and innovation person and not a, and not a, 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 a revenue cycle management person, thank goodness. Uh, not that I'm anything against uh, RP, um, remote, um, sorry, revenue cycle management, but, um, and generally with, um, our, um, the way we also look at it is really kind of looking at the total cost of care, right? And, and you know, what are, what's the impact there in terms of using RPM and what's the impact of, you know, which is a, one of our, one of the, definitely the KPIs that we use along with healthy days at home and, um, you know, reduction in readmission rates. So, you know, for us, it's not just a matter of, you know, each RPM segment gets reimbursement, but we also look at the big picture in regards to, you know, how can we keep people healthy at home and not you know, in the hospital. So that's, that's kind of, we try to take that point of view on it, or at least that's my explanation of it from my um, little financial knowledge in regards yeah. to health, uh, healthcare economics. Um, Rob, uh, jump, jump in here from from uh, from your vantage point. Uh, what what kinds of reimbursements are available for deviceless uh, RPM and and also for other kinds of remote uh, patient monitoring that uh, that at Slu Care you're uh, taking advantage of? Yeah, I think, and I'm actually I'm happy I didn't get the rev specific rev cycle question either. As Kate alluded to, it's not certain my area of expertise and one that I love talking about, but. You know, we we unfortunately have to monitor monitor it, and um, I think one of the, the the biggest one of the things I know we we are monitoring day, uh, daily, weekly is um, how we are getting and if we are continuing to get reimbursed through tele televisits through virtual care. Um, you know, different. I know Illinois is different than Missouri, than you know other states. Um, Illinois seems to wait till uh, the eleventh hour to tell us when they are continuing to reimburse. Um, so it's just an ever-changing landscape. Uh, one, as, as I mentioned earlier, when we sort of stood up uh, quickly uh, utilizing uh, tele and virtual, we all had to collectively sort of uh, take a deep breath and make sure that we were experts in understanding um, that we were meeting criteria for uh, proper billing and coding and, and generating revenue. Um, and of course, since, you know, not my area of expertise, but it's it's one that we have to continue to monitor. And I think decisions are still being made to date um, on how those reimbursements are going to be, uh, be collected, uh, what the future holds. So, uh, you know, that's just kind of all encompassing on how flexibility is sort of the theme word, you know, right now for us and uh, being flexible with, do we push more telehealth? Do we push more in person? Um, you know, are we understanding and making sure that we are capturing proper codes for uh, billing opportunities? Um, you know, that's a, is a kind of a big fire right now internally that we have to make some decisions on some coding uh, that, um, you know, we, we certainly don't want to miss and we don't want to lose the revenue. So it's a, it's a slippery slope and uh, one that we have to continue to sort of keep our, our ears to the ground um, for any specific changes or tweaks in reimbursements. Um, so, so talk a little bit more about uh, outcomes, you know, how um, you presented a little bit on the, um, uh, you know, specifically with the care signal uh, platform, but you know, talk a little bit more about, you know, what kind of outcomes have you seen and 
um, in which particular patient groups has it been most successful? Have you implemented in groups that where it's been less successful and so you've kind of moved them out and have, like, how does that factor into how you've thought about uh, where to target these, these solutions? Well, I can tell you about one of our uh, initiatives that we started back, <clears throat> excuse me, in about roughly May period, time period, um, you know, we identified uh, sort of lower income uh, areas where uh, <clears throat> from our data, we were not seeing patients coming through our doors and coming to you know, visits and scheduling. And we really wanted to make a concerted effort to provide uh, opportunities for, you know, folks in those areas uh, to see their, their providers. And, um, you know, with quarantine, that was very difficult. So we actually uh, started and, and, and continue an initiative uh, we reached out to seven or eight church, different church, local church groups, um, you know, that were in lower income areas and, and urban areas. Uh, and we brought a, a, a volunteer team and we brought uh, and put, you know, dollars behind bringing them sort of a, a virtual computer. Um, what they call it a cow, one of those cows. Uh, they call it different things, computer on wheels. Um, and we, we, we brought it into the church communities to allow them to um, to have a visit, a virtual visit, uh, where normally they wouldn't have the opportunity to get to a computer or get into potentially internet access, or maybe had the means to navigate their way through a virtual visit. Uh, so we, uh, we brought those, the, that equipment in, we brought the staff in, and um, we were at first not very successful, to be quite honest, but uh, we continue to educate, we continue to provide awareness um, and we continue to ensure that we were, um, you know, tweaking certain process and, and tweaking the process uh, in ways that was effective for, for those, that population of patients. And uh, now we see uh, sort of those utilization numbers tick up quite a bit. Um, so it, that's just a, you know, I hope answers your question, but just a, a sort of real time example of how we identified, you know, a certain community or communities uh, that would have, you know, normally would not be able to utilize the technologies or, or make it into a, a actual physical in-person visit. Uh, we targeted them for as a need and uh, we put some resources behind it. And, um, you know, now we can hopefully broaden and, 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 and scale that to a, a larger scale um, process when, you know, when the time is right. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's, I think, really a, a good, uh, it kind of shows the potential of, of this kind of technology in solving uh, problems for categories of patients where otherwise you haven't, um, you know, there, there haven't been ready solutions available. Um, I mean, uh, it's hard to talk about the pandemic and patients without touching on Kind of mental health and behavioral uh, health. It's it's been a really, um, you know, one of the many kind of sad consequences of the pandemic is is just the amount of uh, uh, levels of depression and and uh, kind of mental illness really going up significantly. Um, uh, Kate, what what kind of trends are you seeing there, and and does uh, how does remote patient monitoring factor uh, in, if at all. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, the, the situation we're in has had a huge impact on our, our patients, on obviously our front line. Um, and as an organization, we're, we are looking at um, a number of different initiatives to support both sides. Um, from the patient side of things, uh, uh, we have uh, we had already started um, an initiative to combine, um, really make more collaborative care between behavioral health and primary care, um, which is super important um, because a lot of times patients show up at primary care, they have, you know, it, they may mention, you know, as a, oh, by the way, doctor, you know, as they're leaving, um, the they just haven't been feeling themselves or they're depressed. And so one of the things we've done is really accelerated our, um, the, that whole strategic initiative of, of bringing um, 
behavioral health closer to primary care through um, and what we're looking at is really using technology to um, help assess patients, but then being able to give them the proper level of care depending you know, on their need. Um, and again, using technology from a, on a remote level um, through either um, you know, digital um, self-care apps that are, um, that are definitely evidence-based um, or having a virtual care manager who can make sure that they um, are maybe seeing a telehealth uh, therapist or provider um, all the way to, you know, a telehealth, uh, maybe psychiatric visit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I think it will be great for us to be able to implement that. We're in the process of doing that now. It's a, a screaming problem. Um, there aren't enough um, venues for uh, people to, to get help, and um, we hope to kind of hit, start chipping away at that. Well, Blake, you work with a number of different uh, health systems. What, what are you seeing uh, when it comes to the kind of behavioral health um, these days? I don't, I can't think of, of a, a system. Now, we work with several large FQHCs and, um, and uh, mental healthcare, behavioral healthcare providers. Um, and for them, um, the starting point can be um, behavioral health, for instance, anxiety, depression, substance use, opioid dependence, opioid management. Um, but for most IDNs um, and physician groups, the starting point is chronic conditions and behavioral health is a nice to have when capacity permits. That is starting to shift. So now behavioral health is on the short to midterm strategic roadmap. Um, when I think about, when I run through my, you know, our, our client list, um, I, can, I, can, I can name several um, that have behavioral health or at the very least whole person care as a strategic imperative for the first quarters of next year. All to say, it's really encouraging. I mean, it's so much more expensive uh, when a patient has, you know, a set of, of chronic conditions and then a comorbidity that is behavioral. It's so much more expensive for heaven's sake. You make your money back so quickly. Um, and it's also so addressable with the existing care infrastructure, but finally that shift is starting to happen. So I'm excited. That's good. Um, Kate, let me just switch gears a little bit, come back to you. So um, you have 20 years of experience mm -hmm. in kind of the technology arena um, and now working inside of a health system, what, what are the factors that you see that allow innovations that are created to succeed and make a difference uh, and get traction, you know, versus uh, those that, um, that, that fade away, that, that don't <laughs> succeed? Yeah. Um... The, the biggest issue is um, really an examination of, of how the work is done. Um, so um, innovation is, success, is going to be, bringing in innovation is going to be successful when you look at the big picture of how the work is done rather than just equipping someone who previously used a pencil and now you give them a pen. I, that, that just is not gonna help. And so you really need to think about uh, the people, the process, um, along with the technology, so that you're not just, um, you know, fix, you know, um, putting in place technology that is um, maybe shortening a, a bad system and making it marginally better, and really bringing in a, a new point of view. You really have to think about um, think about that rather than um, a band-aid approach. I think is is really the, the most important. So that means a willingness. Um, to, to maybe tear things apart and, and change workflows. And maybe there uh, will be a learning curve involved for uh, the people involved because it's a different way of doing things in, in addition to technology, which can be one of the reasons why people just don't make any, you know, don't do changes because it, it does require some learning and, um, and change up front, even though it's going to have a better outcome on the back end. 
Um, Rob, your thoughts on that from your uh, vantage point? You've also worked at a number of different health systems. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Kate's definitely, you know, definitely right. And, uh, you know, a lot of the points, just, I don't know if anyone saw me shaking my head probably the whole time she was, you know, commenting. Um, but, you know, it's absolutely right. I think, you know, it's, it's technology is not going away. It's going to continue to advance, um, whether we like it or not, um, you know, and uh, it's going to shape the way we do uh, not only how we work in healthcare, but uh, many other aspects of our lives. You know, so uh, we have to continue to be flexible. We have to continue, excuse me, um, to embrace it. And, um, you know, these, these times that we're in now um, maybe has pushed us in a, in a way to uh, really rethink and reshape the way we're uh, strategizing around technology. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting time. Um, you know, while it's a scary time, it's also a sort of a revolutionary time when we're, the way we're maybe changing a, a lot of our mechanisms and, uh, and process uh, in, in everything. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm interested to see how uh, we all sort of pull together um, once we hopefully get through and, um, you know, start uh, implementing different process and, and utilizing different technologies for, for our benefits and for the, you know, hopefully the greater good out there. Um, there's a few questions from the audience. I've been trying to weave them into the conversation, but there's a few that, uh, that we still uh, have here. So um, uh, could one of you want to volunteer to respond to a question of what's the future of medical office building? So if, uh, as remote patient monitoring, um, you know, we've, we've seen it accelerate. Um, we've got interesting solutions like care signal that we've heard a bit about, you know, today, obviously, and there's, there's other companies with different kinds of technologies for different kinds of populations. Um, you know, as, as these solutions become more ubiquitous, um, what happens to the medical office building? Um, does it go away completely is the, is the question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, use one of my old trader expressions. I would be short um, real estate in, um, in the medical world, because I think that there's, from what we're seeing, um, you know, obviously a lot of care at home will be happening, um, but also there's an, a really an openness to looking at all kinds of new places to have healthcare or medical care happen, which may be, you know, drive-through clinics that might be, you know, from your car because you can use, um, you know, uh, touchless um, sensors that will enable you, um, the providers to collect all kinds of vitals without even having to have a person-to-person -person interaction. Um, I think it's, um, it's going to be a very interesting time because there's a lot of, um, you know, I think definitely there's a, a much more of a willingness to try things. And, and as Rob mentioned, you know, people are they, they want it. I mean, I think now that people have gotten used to uh, virtual, I mean, we use virtual for everything else, uh, you know, in fact, right? And so it's, it really is, is that people will, um, they're going to, they're going to be like, oh, we can do this virtually? Well, great. And um, they're, they're going to demand that we, we be even more flexible in regards to where uh, healthcare is happening. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, maybe I'll ask each of you uh, just very quickly, um, you know, maybe a piece of of advice. So, um, you know, Rob and Rob, I'll start with you, and then Kate. Um, there are a number of uh, people watching who are entrepreneurs who are, um, you know, building solutions and would undoubtedly want to do business with you. Uh, so. Um, if you had one suggestion or piece of advice as to how they should go about it, uh, what would that be? Well, I think uh, I can go fall back on uh, some of the word like wording I've been using uh, throughout this conversation is uh, flexibility, um, and that's sort of one of the biggest things that we uh, that we ask for. Um, you know, when when looking at outside vendors or services or really any internal process uh, for that matter. Um, 
not everything is sort of cut and dry anymore. Um, things change as we see uh, daily, weekly, uh, by the by the minute. Uh, if you look at my email now, and probably things changed from when we started this conversation. So, I think um, <clears throat> just the ability to be flexible uh, and you know to be transparent in communication, uh, no matter what the uh, sort of endeavor is or uh, you know partnership. Um, there is no, maybe there is a right and wrong, but there really is no, uh, you know, hard set way of, of, of looking at things. I mean, when we look at technology, uh, technology can, can do a number of different things in a number of different ways. And, you know, folks out there can use it in a number of different, uh, this may be the same technology in a number of different applications. So uh, I think just being able to be flexible and to be um, really open in expectation and communication is one of the big things uh, that you know we talk about here internally at Sleep Care, and uh, that we, you know, as leaders here, uh, you know, want to sort of instill that culture um, uh, to all of our employees, staff, and and faculty uh, down the line. Um, well, we, we've actually hit the bottom of the hour, so I want to be respectful of uh, of people's time. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, sharing. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rob and and Kate for uh, joining us. Um, particular thanks to Blake for um, really helping us uh, put this together, for sharing your thoughts and kind of framing the conversation uh, at the beginning. Um, really appreciate uh, all of your uh, efforts here, and uh, thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is great. Thank you so much, Kate.